Well guys, David Vos here. Oh my goodness, it's a beautiful day here in Alabama. It really is. I hope you're having a wonderful day where you are. Friends, I had promised to tell you the ingredients in the Holy Sacrament and to explain what that is. Um, and today's the day. Um, gather around. Get you um, a cup of coffee or if you're watching this and it's now sun going down and you're relaxing well get you a glass of wine or or something and uh we're gonna we're gonna go on a journey it is gonna be a journey that you will never forget and when you're done with this journey it'll change your life It will bring you happiness and it will give you understanding. But let me show you a verse in the Bible, Luke 24. And I'd like to read the whole chapter, but let me just focus in on verse from 36 on. It says, Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. He said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do you doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I do. Well, that's a little strange that they would think they had saw a spirit. But moving on, th th this is all very symbolic. Because when they recognize Christ, there's a symbolic meaning that they recognize that inner spiritual Christ. Not something that is uh, in this material world. They really didn't... It, it's, it's a kind of an oddity because they thought they saw a spirit. But Jesus said, no, I'm real. Touch me. I'm real. You can touch me. In other words, you can communicate with me and you can even get so close that you can touch me. I am real. But notice he, he had already said he did not have blood. His body had died and he had been raised up and he said he had flesh and bones. And that's the only place in the scripture where that phrase is used, flesh and bones. So we, we assume then that Jesus had been raised up into an immortal body one that worked on a more harmonious level that wasn't carnal that didn't die it was a change remember we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye we're going to receive our immortality so it's a different thing well it's not in this world so you have many people saying well jesus really was raised up from the dead he came back and and walked around and lived on the earth well now he didn't live on the earth he left right well, he, he, he didn't die. He, he lived. But how did he live? The people that saw him didn't know if they were seeing a spirit. And he didn't have blood. So when the Bible says, touch me, does it really mean physically touch me? Or is that word... You know, remember when Jesus was standing there and um, this woman, uh, there was a crowd of people. And there were people everywhere touching Jesus, trying to get to him. But there was this woman that had a flow of blood for 12 years. And it says in the Bible, she said, if I could just touch him, I know that I'd be well. What does it mean to touch the Christ? It means to, not just to see it, because you might not believe it if you didn't touch it, see? You, you, you might think, well, it's just an apparition. It's not real. I'm just imagining it. Touching has some other connotation doesn't have to mean that you physically touch something. It means, you know, like when somebody says, well, I, I heard this poem and it touched me. Poems can't touch you. People who love you say touching words. Words can touch you. Here they were touched. And let's go on. It says, when he had said these things, he showed them his hands and his feet, 
But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? Oh, well, this proves he, he, he really raised up his, his body, right? Because he ate food in their, in their presence. And remember, Thomas touched his hands and felt the, the nail holes. Why would there be nail holes in his immortal body? What kind of touching are we talking about? So it says, while they did not believe for joy and marveled, he said, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb and he took it and ate it in their presence. All right. Now I want to show you something. This is a Bible hub. So I'm going to click on that verse, verse uh, 42, and it says, and he gave them a piece of broiled fish. It doesn't mention the honey. Isn't that interesting? They took that part of the sentence out of the Bible. It doesn't say it in any of the translations, except for a very few of them. The original King James has, and of a honeycomb. Right? And the New King James does too. But a lot of the other words, New American Bible, the Amplified, the Christian Standard, the Holman Christian Bible, the American Standard Bible, you know, all the way down, 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 down. The literal standard version has it because it's a literal version. They got to put it there because they, they're, they're saying, oh, we're going to do it literally. So they had to do it. You know, this is a literal translation. We're just going to tell you what it actually says. Oh, well, thanks. Maybe we should just always use a literal, right? Well, anyway, it goes down and most, almost all of the translations take out the word and the honey or the honeycomb. So let's go back for a second and see what's going on here. So how come this is an interlinear that you can go to that will tell you the meaning of each of the words? But when you go to the interlinear, it's missing those words. Well, notice this K right there, just before and some honeycomb. Click on the K and notice that it says, omits and certain other women with them, omits greatly, nonsense, omits lying, omits, as these are places that, that in Luke where um, the translation that we have is omitted. They didn't put it. Look how many different places and things that they said that, that's in the text, but they didn't put it there. Now, what they're telling you is, is that they've admitted that honeycomb, that the phrase, they've taken that out of your Bibles. It's in the original King James, but the rest of them know. I wonder if there's something that they don't want you to know. Friends, that's what we're going to tell you. Now, I will tell you this. That word, honeycomb, is a word that in Greek is melisse. Now, let me show you that. All right, so you go to the Goggle Brothers and you look up, you put, I put in Melissa Greek meaning. And it says, B, the name Melissa derives from the Greek word Melissa, meaning B, which was taken from the word Meli, meaning honey. It is therefore no surprise to learn that the name Melissa means honey bee. Interesting. So, just to let you know that the word that they took out of the Bible is this word, Melissa. Do you want to know why they took that word out of the Bible? Because this is the holy sacrament. It's the food that if you'd have kept on reading there in Luke, when they, they uh, partook of that food that Jesus made for them, they all of a sudden, their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. All of a sudden, something they thought was a spirit they touched. They verified something they didn't believe in before, but now they believed in. And their eyes were open. As we've said, the word there is the inner spiritual eye. Their spiritual understanding became opened. They literally was aware and conscious now of something that is deeper than any normal human being. And the reason they became enlightened is because they ate something that's called Melissa. Now, before we go on, I just want to make one quick point. You remember the other day when we were talking about the Essenes and we said that the Temple of Artemis and the Eleusinian 
priesthood, they had priestesses that they called Melissae. They were Melissae. That's, it meant a honeybee. You've probably seen the Mormons, that, the, you know, the honeybee state or the beehive state or whatever. They got this little symbol that the Mormons use for their church. It's a beehive. Very interesting. All right, now let's go back to what I was going to show you before and let's read something. The Melissae of ancient Greece. But I will tell you another thing, son of all glorious May and Zeus, who holds the ages. Well, the ages is the Aegean Sea up around Greece. That's where they went, right? And they started the Eleusinian Mysteries and a little further north up in Ephesus, they started the Temple of Artemis. They had the Sibyl Oracle and, and the De Oracle of Delphi and stuff like this. And we've talked about that. So it's this luck bringing genius of the gods. There are certain holy ones, sisters born, three virgins gifted with wings. Their heads are besprinkled with white meal and they dwell under a ridge of Parnassus. These are teachers of divination apart from me. The art which I practiced while yet a boy following herds. Though my father paid no heed to it, from their home they fly, now here, now there, feeding on honeycomb and bringing all things to pass. And when they had inspired through eating yellow honey, they are willing to speak truth. But if they be deprived of the then God's they speak falsely. sweet food. So, there's this food that that belongs to the gods, right? It's very sweet. It has something to do with honey. And when you eat it, you speak truthfully. What kind of truth? Is it like a truth serum? No. But it's because when you eat this, you're going to know the truth so you can speak it. You don't know the truth until you eat this. You're in a delusion. You're in this world. You're eating the, 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 the mundane food that does not bring enlightenment. If you want to have enlightenment, you must reach out your spear and take on the tip of the spear, take a little of the honey and put it to your tongue as that scripture there in the Old Testament states that Jonathan did and got enlightenment. So, going on, it says, Then they speak falsely as they swarm in and out together. These then I give you. Inquire of them strictly and delight your heart. And if you should teach any mortal so to do, often will he hear your response. If we have good fortune, take these son of May and tend the wild roving horned oxen and horses and patient mules. Okay, that is in the, uh, the Homeric hymns. According to the Homeric but, hymn to Hermes, the Thry were three nymphs who taught the art of prophecy to Apollo. So, this is about prophecy. This is about speaking the truth. Finding the truth. Having your eyes open. Becoming aware of something. Apollo taught it to Hermes. Remember, Hermes is that guy that went down in the, into the hell and conquered it. Thoth. The, um, it's also Enoch, right? He was taken and wrote the, the great book that is the book of destiny, which is astrology. We talked about the hermetic wisdom, the book of Thoth, the book of destiny. Well, who taught Jesus all of this? Well, he went to hell. See, experience in hell taught it to him. Remember, Apollyon, Apollo is the god of the underworld, Jehovah. Yeah, Jehovah rules over this world, it's a classroom. Jesus had to come into this world, partook of flesh and blood, and partook of these mysteries himself, and learned right square straight from the devil like everybody else. Who was the God that escorted souls to the underworld and then escorted them back into life again? Is it really talking about dying physically and going to a literal place called hell? Or is it, is it talking about an experience, a trip, where you go into a trance-like or a death-like state and have this experience where you find truth and then you come back after three days or something. Let's continue. They were the original Melissae or bee nymphs of Mount 
Parnassus, named Melania, the Black, Cladora, famed for her gift, and Daphne's Laurel, often described as women with wings. Those are the little fairies you see by the Amanita Muscara in all the pictures. Because the Melissae, they are always hovering over the great Amanita Muscara, which is, as we, wait till we get to it, guys. So it says, often described as women with wings and hair that appears white because of how much pollen was covering it. They are generally considered to be the triple goddess aspect of the pure mother bee, also called Pocnea, who was possibly the older goddess that originally dwelled on Mount Parnassus before Zeus and his siblings came into power. Now, remember too that the bee is essential for pollinating the fields and the flowers. And remember, part of the Eleusinian mysteries was as we said the other day, had something to do with some sort of food that they made with some sort of thing called the narcissus or na narcissus or whatever. It's where we get the word narcotic or drug. And we found out that that flower, today we call it a daffodil. There are a couple of other names for it. And they used it somehow or another in their mystery schools to enlighten people. So the bee was very important to going out and landing on these flowers, the bee would come back with some sort of pollen on it. And certain bees can give you certain, pollinate certain types of flowers and vegetation that when they make their honey, it's a very hallucinogenic honey. Okay, now you stepped in it, Dave. That's it, I'm turning this stuff off. Are you crazy? Oh, come on. Honeybees can give you a uh, psychedelic effect or, or hallucinogenic uh, properties out of honey. I don't believe that. I'm done. I'm going to click this off right here. Well, hang on. Watch this. Take a look at this. The ah, mad honey. <laughs> look at that. Mad honey. This hallucinogenic honey can sell for over $60 a pound. That sounds kind of cheap, actually. Give me some of that. 60 bucks for a whole pound? Well, I guess it's a little expensive. But anyway, on the black market, well, what is this hallucinogenic honey? Well, it's uh, when bees feed on the pollen of the rhododendron. Oh, we got another flower. I know the rhododendrons grow in Oregon. I wish I'd have known that when me and my friend were out there in the back seat of that you know, 57 Ford, you know, sitting around trying to get high off of a bottle of Michelob, right? Holy mackerelly! There was rhododendrons growing everywhere. The rhododendron flowers, the resulting honey can pack a hallucinogenic punch. It's called mad honey, and it has a slightly bitter taste and a reddish color, more notably a few types of rhododendrons. Among them, Rhododendron luteum and Rhododendron ponticum contain gray and otoxin, which can cause a dramatic, dramatic psychological reactions in humans and animals depending on how much a person consumes. Reactions can range from hallucinations and a slower heartbeat to temporary paralysis and unconsciousness. Is that what happens when you go to the underworld to learn from the devil all your sins and come face to face with every evil which is all an illusion of course remember we've been telling you the devil's just an illusion it's a world that you make yourself it's your dream world and we're creating it or manifesting it right manifesting it around ourselves in the real world now what yeah there have been no modern deaths recorded from eating mad honey but as rhododendrons flourish at high altitudes, and as the bees often nest on sheer cliffs, gathering the honey may be more dangerous than consuming it. So it's not really dangerous to partake of it, see. Just like they always try to tell you, don't eat that mushroom. Mushrooms are all poison, Dave. You can't eat mushrooms. Um, well, so they say. Anyway, now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, Moving on to uh, what we were saying. 
So going down, it, 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 there's a picture of uh, what appears to be a bee or a queen bee. She's got the little bee um, stinger on the bottom. There's the flowers, two flowers in the background. And then she's got the wings. And she does look kind of Egyptian as well. Well, it says later associated, because we're going to find out it has to do with Aphrodite, Astarte, Easter, right? Later associated with Kor and the Eleusinian Mysteries, this may have been the goddess that oversaw the infamous labyrinth in Crete where beekeeping was a sacred practice. In the Eleusinian Mysteries, the three Melissae represented Kor's descent into the underworld. Oh, remember uh, Astarte and Ashtaroth, you know, these, these deities, they went down into hell. The descent into hell. Demeter's search for Kor and finally Kor's ascent back to the upper world. See, all the nations had their own version of these stories. This Demeter that we talked about the other day that has something to do also with uh, Elijah became the Elysian Mysteries or the Elisha Mysteries. So it says, Potnia means the mistress and is often associated with larger earth mother figures such as Gaia and Re. Many priestesses of important goddesses were called Melissae or just simply bees. The Delphic oracle herself was often called the Delphic bee and the complex at Delphi was said to be based on a beehive. What do the Mormons know that they're not telling anyone, even their own members? Or do they not know why they're carrying around the beehive and they become the beehive state? You know, maybe Joseph Smith never explained it to them and they're just you know, I don't know, but we got this beehive here. It must mean something, right? They claim they know everything, but they don't tell anybody what they're... These mysteries, these, these, these individuals running around the world today, they've got these beautiful mysteries, but they don't want to tell anybody what it means. I wonder why. Trying to keep all the good stuff for themselves, right? This great knowledge to become like God, and we'll just be like peasants and slaves because we don't have the knowledge. So it says... Potnia seems to have later evolved into various aspects of Artemis, Aphrodite, Demeter, and Sibyl. Remember the Sibyl oracles? The Sibylline oracle? Though Artemis, as the goddess of the wild animals, is the goddess who most usually came to be associated with bees. There's a couple of coins, and the one on the right is obviously Artemis, who was always associated with that deer, and she's like Mother Nature. And the one on the left is this Again, looks like a bee. Very interesting. Another story tells of the nymph Melissa who taught people about honey. She discovered the honey in a honeycomb and taught people how to mix it with water and then drink it. Hmm. She was considered one of the goddesses responsible for civilizing mankind. All this has to do with civilization. Well, maybe what we're doing today, building all these buildings and, and, and buying and selling and keeping people in slaves and keeping them in the dark and not enlightening them and giving, you know, not telling them they're like God, right? But telling them you're a slave, oh, Jacob, you worm. Get down and worship me. I am God and there is none else. I will not pardon your sins. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we need enlightenment. You see. So... Um, thus, the bee was named for her. The production of honey was considered to be magical and divine. Because of Melissa's association with bees, medieval beekeepers believed that without a virtuous or civilized beekeeper, the honey couldn't be made. Honeybees are, of course, extremely important to agriculture in most areas of the world, while medieval beekeepers didn't know why. Really, this guy doesn't know anything about the mysteries that's right in this article, right? He don't know what he's talking about, but he knows what they were thinking in medieval times. He knew they didn't know that bees pollinated plants. He didn't, you know, he, he, you know it's unbelievable the things that people will say. <clears throat> like Jesus didn't know what he was talking about when he gave his disciples Melissa, right? He didn't know what he's talking about. So it says, um, Melissa hid the baby Zeus from Kronos. Oh, by the way, they realized that the bees needed to be kept happy. All right. 
Melissa hid the baby Zeus from Kronos, his father, who was determined to devour him as he had done to Zeus' siblings. She nursed Zeus with milk and honey. Oh, like the land flowing with milk and honey? I wonder why that was so important that the Lord said, I'm taking you to a land of milk and honey. Right? It was a fairyland, a place where they could be touching Jesus, a place where they could have their eyes open and know that they are God. But remember, the children of Israel said, nah, no thanks. We would like to go back to Egypt when we were slaves, we had the meat pots. Oh, we're wishing we could go back down there and be slaves so we could eat some meat because we're craving some meat. We want to kill somebody. We don't want no milk and honey. Dadgummit, Moses, please. You brought us out here in the desert to die. And, and Moses is like, no, I'm going to give you some milk and honey that will open your eyes and send you to paradise. And they're like, no, thanks. Okay. You guys go ahead and do whatever you want. I can make honey from this rock right here. <laughs> we ain't gonna need no dadgum Egypt. Come on down. We're going to a land of milk and so, honey. Melissa hid the baby Zeus from Cronus. Uh, ba 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 ba. So she nursed Zeus with milk and honey. When Cronus discovered her role in sheltering Zeus, he turned her into an earthworm. Hmm, is that like Yahweh turning Israel into a worm? Zeus in thanks for all that she had done for him, then changed her into a bee instead. And forever afterwards, Zeus always loved honey. A different story tells about an aging priestess of Demeter named Melissa, who was initiated into Demeter's mysteries by the goddess herself. When Melissa refused to tell the secrets of her initiation, remember how the Apostle Paul said for three years, uh, he that he spent with the the, uh, the Essenes at Damascus. And at the end of those three years, he heard words that it was not lawful for a person to speak. He was initiated. Josephus says that the Essenes initiated you for three years into the mysteries. And then at the end of those three years, you were given the final information that you knew. But it was unlawful to tell anyone else. They had to go through the mysteries. They had to be initiated. So, Demeter named Melissa, who was initiated into Demeter's mysteries by the goddess herself. So, how were they initiated by the goddess, Melissa? Maybe that, that honey drink that they were drinking could have initiated them or taken them somewhere to a fairy land. And when you listen to the fairy, she flies over an Amanita mascara and gives you the secrets of how you can learn and open your eyes and touch Jesus? I don't know. So it says, When Melissa refused to tell the secrets of her initiation, other women tore her apart. In anger, the goddess Demetrius sent a plague of bees against the jealous women. Melissa was also associated with Artemis. Artemis eased the pain of mothers giving birth. How do you ease the pain of mothers giving birth? Maybe through a drug? A potion that would give them some relaxation and maybe take away the pain? And Melissa sent the souls of the newborns to their bodies in the shape of bees. Huh. Aphrodite had her own association with bees. Was often called Melissa. Aphrodite was called Melissa. Queen, the queen bee. I guess there's a little picture of her. Alfred Dreur in 1514. Eros, Venus, and the Bees. In all the stories, the Melissa are symbols of regeneration and renewal and are also usually considered the to be associated with the underworld. The etymology of the word fate in Greek offers a fascinating example of how the genius of the Minoan version entered the Greek language often visibly as well as informing its stories of goddesses and gods. The Greek word for fate, death, and goddess of death is eker, feminine. The word for heart and breast is to ker, while the word for honeycomb is to kerion. The common root ker links the ideas of the honeycomb, goddess, death, 
fate and the human heart, a nexus of meanings that is illumined if we know that the goddess was once imagined as a bee. Well, that's interesting because in that verse we read where it mentions Melissa, it also in the Greek has a word that is kirion. That word is there in the text. I'll show you that in a minute. Well, I thought I would show you rather than just say it's there and then you'd believe me because I wouldn't believe me either. This is literally insane. I can't believe we've been lied to like this, but here it is. Honeycomb Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. It says, uh, Melissios, signifying made by bees. From Melissa, a bee, is found with carrion, a comb, in some manuscripts in Luke 24, 42. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Very interesting. All these words, you know, which are part of the holy sacrament that Jesus gave us is also part of the holy sacrament that John the Baptist gave us. I mean, this goes back to the Eleusinian mysteries, the uh, Sibyl oracles, the Delphi, or which is the same, I guess. The, the, the Sibyl was at Delphi but also the Temple of Artemis and all these other ancient mysteries. Use these particular words for priestesses, even using the name Essenes for their priests. Very interesting. Oh, and all the virgins. But let me just keep reading here. It says, The Melissa were virginal priestesses because of the pureness of the honey. They drank a toxic honey. Toxic? Hmm. Remember that word in Revelation chapter 6 where the, the, the rider of the white horse has a bow? Well, in Greek, that word is toxic. And so we were saying it was a biological warfare. Interesting. But it was made from psychedelic plants. Interesting. So the bees gathered their pollen from psychedelic plants to enable themselves to experience visions. Transgendered priests in the temples of Artemis were often called Essenes. Friends, that word, Essenes, is exactly the same spelling as the Essenes that we've been talking about that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, that lived all the way up to Damascus, all the way down to the Dead Sea, all the way up into Greece. These priests were all over the, the then known world. They were called Essene priests. They, they were priestesses, virgins. Remember in the Bible it says that men can be virgins too. The 144,000 are all virgins. They're all virgins. Jesus was always surrounded by the virgins. And Jesus... Uh, when they asked him about divorce, said something about, well, only those who can do it can make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom. What is a eunuch? Well, if you go and read the Bhagavad Gita, you'll find that many of the original eunuchs were transgenders, or some say they were gay. Now, I'm not saying that it has to do with being literally gay. Christians just think, well, it means they were castrated. They didn't have sexual feelings. In other words, they didn't have any feelings for girls or boys. Maybe that's it. But they were priests. Some sort of priests. The eunuchs were priests. Jesus was saying, if you could become a eunuch and give up this world that Yahweh's created, where it's like uh, you got to purchase a woman and own a manor and run around and buy and sell and own people as slaves and vengeance and war. Jesus said, no, get out of the world. Literally, I want you to join the convent, become a priestess. I got some young women around here, these virgins and some other disciples that are also, like Paul says, remain as I am. I think it would be better. Paul had been married once. He was a widow. Well, we'll get into that in another video because that's a very, very interesting subject. No, I'm not promoting transgenderism. I'm simply reading an article, and they use that word. I don't think they were transgenders. I certainly don't believe that there were any 
uh, men in the days of, uh, you know, the temple at Artemis that were running around whacking off their wee-wees and, you know, claiming that they didn't, they weren't born in the right body. First of all, a transgender today is very sexual, right? They were men, they want to be girls, or they're girls and they want to be men, right? This has nothing to do with that. So that's the wrong word. They're not transgenders. What they are is people that devote themselves to the holy scriptures and to giving, feeding the poor, and helping one another. And there were things they did in the temple that we will discuss at a later date. Right now, I just want to find out what this honey is that Jesus fed the disciples. So, <clears throat> they were called Essenes or drones and were, help, they were there to help the Melissa. So the Essenes were priestesses to help the queen bee, Melissa. So now we've got three things that Jesus was doing as he was standing there that corresponds to this. He, had, he was giving them some special food that opened their eyes so they could see him and touch him and awaken to some other consciousness had their eyes open, like Adam and Eve that had, you know, the initiation, had their eyes opened. But also, his priests were called Essenes. John the Baptist's priests were Essenes, and they went and followed Jesus. And not only that, there's a word in Melissa that they've taken out of the Bible. I wonder why. When Jesus fed them something, he's talking about Melissa. Is that the toxic honey? Was that the kind of honey he fed them? And then we've got this other word, cur, or curion, which is in the text. So, bees are often called veil-winged. You know, remember the, the fairies that kind of have like bee wings? They look like little bee wings. You know, the artists in modern times have kind of changed uh, what a fairy looks like. But if you go back to the earlier depictions of the fairies, they always had little bee bodies, wings with little bee bodies and human faces. So it says, the bees are called veil-winged and represent the veil you had to cross to reach the goddess in the inner temple. I see this as initiation. And a woman's hymen, which of course veiled her body from sexuality until she was initiated into womanhood. The Melissa were often consulted in matters of marriage. Bees dance, and so did the Melissa. Accordingly, this is part of the reason that Apollo, who learned the art of prophecy from the Melissa, was also the god of light and music. Sacred music and dance played an important role in the lives of the Melissa. Bees, who are known for their industry and order, were also used as examples of how a priestess should live her life. She helped her community, assisted in healing the sick, crafted tools and objects and were capable of giving someone a good sting or set down when they needed it. All right, so we said that the sa sacred sacrament may have something to do with the Amanita mushroom. Now, where do we find that connection? Well, here, let me read you something from the Wikipedia on Ambrosia. In ancient Greek myths, ambrosia, which means immortality, the food or drink of the Greek gods, is often depicted as conferring longevity, immortality upon whomever consumed it. It was brought to the gods in Olympus by doves and served either by Hibi or by Ganymede at the heavenly feast. Ancient art sometimes depicted ambrosia as distributed by the nymph named Ambrosia, a nurse of Dionysius. There they're having the, looks like the Last Supper, right, with Jesus' disciples, but this is uh, the food of the gods on Olympus. Maybe it's the same story. So it says, Ambrosia is very closely related to the gods, other form of sustenance, nectar. The two terms may not have originally been Distinguished, though in Homer's poems, nectar is usually the drink of an ambrosia, the food of the gods. So one is the drink and one is the food. It was with ambrosia that Hera cleansed all defilement from her lovely flesh 
and with ambrosia, Athena prepared Penelope in her sleep, so that when she appeared for the final time before her suitors, the effects of years had been stripped away. Huh, she got younger. And they were inflamed with passion at the sight of her. On the other hand, in Alcman's, nectar is the food, and in Sappho, and Anaxdritis, ambrosia is the drink. A character in Aristophanes' Night says, I dreamed the goddess poured ambrosia over your head out of a ladle. Both descriptions could be correct, as ambrosia could be a liquid considered a food, such as honey. It could be. They're speculating. The consumption of ambrosia was typically reserved for divine beings. Upon his assumption into immortality on Olympus, Hercules is given ambrosia by Athena, while the hero Tydeus is denied the same thing when the goddess discovers him eating human brains. Huh? In one version of the myth of Tantalus, part of Tantalus's crime is that after tasting ambrosia himself, he attempts to steal some to give to the other mortals. And those who consume ambrosia typically have ichor, not blood in their veins. Hmm. So anyone who partakes of this ambrosia, which is the food of the gods, they attain unto immortality. And you're not allowed to give it to mortals unless the gods allow you to do it. And when you drink it, you no longer have blood running through your veins. That's what Jesus said after he partook of something and gave it to them and their eyes were open. And he didn't have blood in his veins. Just flesh and bones. So what is Icar? Well, we click on that and it says in Greek mythology, Icar is the ethereal fluid that is in the blood of the gods and the immortals. The ancient Greek word Icar is of uncertain etymology and has been suggested to be a foreign word. Hmm, well, they're going back to the mysteries, which tell us that you have spirit in your veins, ethereal fluid. So, both nectar and ambrosia are fragrant and may be used as perfume in the Odyssey. So, I want to kind of skip over a little of this because... Um, Let's go down here where it says, Pliny used the term in connection with different plants, as did early herbalists. Additionally, some modern ethnomycologists, such as Danny Staples, identify ambrosia with the hallucinogenic mushroom Amanita muscaria. It was the food of the gods. Their ambrosia and nectar was the press sap of its juices, they assert. Well, it, when you go down here to the word etymology, they explain a little bit, but not very convincingly, because they're really trying to hide this information from you. So they go back and they say it has something to do with the Sanskrit, this word in Sanskrit, which is A-M-R-T-A, -A, Amrta, Amrta. And that was the uh, Sanskrit immortality drink of the ancient gods. Well, instead of reading it from here, where they're trying, obviously, to obfuscate the whole thing, and they don't explain what this Amarta really is. Let me show you something else. Amrita, Sanskrit. Am, amrta, Amrit, or Amata, in Pali, also called Sudha, Amhi, Ami, is a Sanskrit word that means immortality. It is a central concept with Indian religions and is often referred to in ancient Indian texts as an elixir. Well, same kind of thing we're talking about, right? Some sort of uh, nectar. The nectar of the gods. Its first occurrence is in the Rig Veda, where it is considered one of the several synonyms for Soma. Uh, the drink of the divas. Amrita plays a significant role in the Samudra Mantan, and is the cause of the conflict between divas and asuras, competing for Amrita to obtain immortality. Amrita has varying significance in different Indian religions. The word Amrit is also a common first name for the Sikhs and Hindus, while its feminine form is Amrita. 
Amrita is cognate too and shares many similarities with ambrosia. Both originated from a common Proto-Indo-European source. All right, etymology. Amrita is composed of the negative prefix, whatever that is, from Sanskrit meaning not, and M-R-T-Y-U, Mertu, meaning death in Sanskrit, thus meaning not death, or immortality, deathless. The concept of immortality drink is attested in at least two ancient Indo-European languages, ancient Greek and Sanskrit. The Greek ambrosia, ambrosia, is semantically linked to the Sanskrit amarta, as both words denote a drink or food that gods used to achieve immortality. The two words appear to be derived from the same Indo-European form Nimertos, undying. Um, both Greek and Sanskrit are derived zero grade of mer, and semantically similar etymology exists for the Greek nectar. The beverage of the gods, nectar in Greek, presumed to be a compound of pie roots, neck, death, and tar, overcoming Hinduism. Amritas repeatedly referred to as the drink of the divas, which grants them immortality. Despite this, the nectar does not actually offer true immortality. Instead, by partaking it, the divas were able to attain a higher level of knowledge and power, which they had lost due to the curse of sage Durvasa, as described in the Samudra Manthana legend. It tells how the divas, after the curse, began to lose their immortality, assisted by their rivals, the Asuras. The divas began to churn the ocean, releasing, among other extraordinary objects and beings, the Amrita. In Sikhism, uh, in the Punjabi, is the name of the holy water used in Amrit Sanchar, a ceremony which resembles baptism. This ceremony is observed to initiate the Sikhs into the Khalsa and requires drinking Amrit. This is created by mixing a number of soluble ingredients including sugar and it is then rolled with a kanda with the accompaniment of scriptural recitation of five sacred verses. Metaphorically, God's name is also referred to as nectar. So in Buddhism, Buddha is called a amata, santam. Uh, according to Thanissaro Bhikkhu, the deathless refers to the deathless dimension of the mind which is dwelled in permanently after Nibbana. In the Amata Sutta, the Buddha advises monks to stay with the four Satipatthana monks. Remain with your minds well established in these four establishing of mindfulness. Don't let the deathless be lost to you. So what was the nectar of the gods that the Hindus used? They call it Soma many times. It was that, as we read earlier, it was the, the Indian Soma. And it says of that Soma in ancient India, an unidentified plant, the juice of which was a fundamental offering of the Vedic sacrifices. The stalks of the plant were pressed between stones and the juice was filtered through sheep wool and then mixed with water and milk. Well, what kind of plant did they use? So it says, Rig Veda, the holy book of the Hindu, Soma, name given to the mushroom god described in the Rig Veda, which was used in religious ceremonies and has hallucinogenic properties. It was thought by Wasson and others to be the mushroom Amanita muscaria. Very interesting. <clears throat> so if it's not enough that all the traditions are from the same source. This is all the mysteries that was brought all around the world that all came from Israel when they were scattered into all the world. And so there is a cognate parallel between the Sanskrit and the Greek with the nectar and the ambrosia. They come from the same word and that word is amrita 
and sometimes it's called Amata, and Buddha talks about the Amata, and that is the same as the Amanita mushroom. And this is why we know, because as we read before, in the Indian writings of the Riga Vita, they call it the Soma, and they describe it as that nectar. And they call it the Soma there as well. They have different names. And by the way, you see it in all the, the pictures and the paintings. See, the, the sages and, and, and these individuals who knew these mysteries, when they couldn't tell the world, they would paint them. Or they would write songs or whatever. Or put it in sacred writings and, and obscure it with symbolism. This is what they did in the Bible in, chap, in Luke chapter 24 that we just read. So it says, yet the picture on the left of this mushroom will, will probably be familiar to the reader. It's widely recognized in popular culture because of its unique appearance. And of course, that's the Amanita mascara. And it says, however, it is more than just a photogenic mushroom that is used as a commercial representative of the mushroom. It is a species that is thought to have had tremendous impact on some of today's cultures for at least 4,000 years and has been thought by some to be at the root of the origin of some of today's religions. In 1968, Gordon Wasson put forth the concept that this mushroom was the plant that was referred to as the Soma in his now much-cited Soma divine mushroom of immortality. Wasson believes Soma was the mushroom that was utilized in religious ceremonies over 4,000 years ago before the beginning of our Christian era. And the people who called themselves Arians, Wasson also believed the hallucinogenic properties of the Amanita mascara to be the cause of the ecstasy described in the Rig Veda, the holy book of the Hindu, in order to appreciate the story behind the legend of Soma. So, how can we be sure that this sacred plant that they squeezed to get this nectar was the mushroom, the Amanita mushroom? Well, notice this. The mushroom of the Noing Ula rug and a Persian Ethiogen. There is the rug. It says, embroidered rug depicting Hauma ritual. That is the same as the Soma. The Soma and the Hauma is the same um, substance. And it says, the Hauma ritual discovered at the Noin Ulma burial site. Note, individual second from right holding large mushroom over fire altar. And there's the picture of it. There's somebody holding what very clearly is a mushroom. It says, detail of individual depicted holding mushroom over fire altar on Noing Ula rug. Note, semicircles at edge of mushroom cap, intended probably to show spots, either of the Ciliocibi cubinuses cap or Amanita muscaria cap, although impossible to identify mushroom species for certain. But, you know, I'm going to probably go ahead and wrap this up here, and we'll do more, and we'll you know, do some more videos on this and get some more information out to you. But um, there's a lot we could add. This video is getting long and we're about ready to end um, the video here and draw this to a conclusion in about an hour. But I could add a whole bunch of early pictures and paintings in Christian art with the mushroom playing a, a, a very clear role in all of this. But I'm going to go ahead and just leave it here, guys, and we'll get into this a little further maybe in some coming videos. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good one.